There are four main vital signs that we want to obtain on patients so that we can trend them and we can also figure out exactly what condition they're in. So those four vital signs are blood pressure, respiratory rate or breathing rate, and then heart rate. And our last one is oxygen saturation. Simply put, oxygen saturation is an average of how many red blood cells in your bloodstream actually have oxygen attached to them. That's what we're counting when we get this percentage that sometimes reads 94, 96, 98, and then worst cases, reads down into the 80s and maybe 70s. We hope that you've been enjoying our videos and we hope that some of this information has been valuable for you. So if you find this information valuable, we really appreciate a like on the videos. Leave us a comment if you have any feedback for us, any questions, any things that we could do to improve things in the future. If you have any requests for any specific types of videos, leave those in the comments. And last but not least, go ahead and subscribe to the channel so you'll be alerted of any videos we do in the future. Now, back to Pulse Ox. So why is this number important to us? Well, when we take a breath in, we breathe in oxygen from the air, it goes into our lungs. That oxygen from the lungs then binds to our red blood cells in our bloodstream and the heart then pumps that around our bodies. Our cells all need oxygen to survive. Everything in your body is made up of cells, so everything in your body needs some form of oxygen to be able to continue to live. That's why oxygen is so important. So if there is a disease process or some issue that prevents that oxygen from getting to the bloodstream like it needs to be, we can sometimes pick up on that by using a tool to monitor that oxygen saturation. By picking up on this, we can then know that we have an airway issue or maybe a respiratory issue. And there's now something that we could possibly do to help remedy this to keep this patient alive by knowing that now they have decreased oxygen saturation. Okay, so let's dive a little bit deeper for a minute. So in your blood, you have red blood cells. This red blood cell is the part of the blood that carries the oxygen. The red blood cell is a helix shape. Now, whether or not it has oxygen bound to the red blood cell or not, this helix will either tighten or loosen. And when it does that, it actually changes color. So when it has oxygen bound to it, it's a bright red. When it doesn't have oxygen bound to it, it's a darker red or more of a purple color. That's why when we're looking at arterial bleeding, severe arterial bleeding, when we're applying tourniquets, we're looking for bright red bleeding typically because that's oxygenated blood coming from the heart. When it doesn't have the oxygen bound to it, that's venous bleeding typically. So the blood actually changes color depending on whether or not it has oxygen bound to it. So blood with oxygen, bright red. Blood without oxygen, purple. How do we measure oxygen saturation? Well, we're gonna use this cool little tool called a pulse oximeter. So this pulse oximeter is gonna use a couple different lights. It shines it through your nail bed, and based on the color of your blood, it's gonna get an approximate number, approximate count of how many hemoglobin in your blood have oxygen attached to them. And you'll get a percentage readout like 98%, 96%. You're shooting for something in the 90s. It may be in the 80s if it's low, and worst case, it might be in the 70s. That's not very good though. So we need to give them some supplemental oxygen or do something for them to try to get back up into the 90s. So before we go any further, what is a normal range for oxygen? Normal range is typically 94 to 100%. Recently, there have been some people that said, well, if you put someone on supplemental oxygen for a long time and they're at 100%, we have no way of knowing that there's not more oxygen being diffused into the bloodstream once all the hemoglobin are full of oxygen. So there could be some danger in having someone on a large amount of supplemental oxygen, then reading 100% and then being on this for an extended amount of time. That's not something we're gonna dive into in this video, but I do want to point that out because a lot of people are now saying, hey, let's go 93 to 99% um, on that normal range. So 93, 94 on the low end, let's try not to get it above 99. But if you put a pulse ox on a healthy person, it reads 100%, nothing wrong with them. They're good to go. But it indicates they don't need additional oxygen from a nasal cannula or some other uh, oxygen delivery device. If someone drops below 93% oxygen on the pulse ox, then we could say that they are mildly hypoxic. Now, once they drop down into the 80s, it gets more severe, and we really don't ever want to see a patient in the 70s. It happens, I've seen it, but those people in the 70s and sometimes even 60s, those are people that we need to start treating aggressively, and we need to get that oxygen percentage back up. 
because that's very dangerous for their brain and other organs to be functioning um, with such a low state of oxygen. So that's something we need to address quickly. But the normal range for oxygen should be between 93 and 99%. There's a couple different types of pulse oximeters or a pulse ox. This is a little portable one that you can get off Amazon. It's like $20, super cheap. And then there's more advanced ones that will actually give you a waveform of how accurate and how well it's reading the information that it's presenting to you. So those are ones that are typically on cardiac monitors that EMTs and paramedics use. They're standalone devices that you can get that'll give you a waveform. So there's more advanced options out there, but most of the time someone's gonna have one like this. It's a little home pulse ox you can get off Amazon. It's pretty cheap and economical, and it does a pretty decent job as long as you know that you're getting accurate reading and how to look for accurate readings on these, which we'll talk about. So a pulse ox should have three main pieces of data that it gives you. One is gonna be the oxygen saturation in a percentage. Another one is gonna be the heart rate. So as it's reading the oxygen saturation, it's picking up on the heart rate, so it gives that as a readout on here as well. So it's not necessarily a good um, substitute for taking a radio pulse. You still should check a radio pulse, but this is cool to be able to trend that pulse and be able to see if it's getting higher, lower, what's going on with the pulse at a quick glance. So that's useful on here. The third piece of data that these things provide is a waveform or some type of readout that gives you data that tells you whether or not this information you're getting from the oxygen percentage is accurate. This one has a little bar that bounces up and down with the pulse. If that bar is not bouncing from the bottom to the top and having a good bounce every time, then the data I'm getting from this pulse ox is probably not very accurate. On the more expensive devices, they actually have a waveform, which we'll show you in a little bit, and that waveform is what tells you that you're getting a good reading. Okay, but how does the pulse ox work? Well, there's a few things we need to look at. So the pulse ox is curved to fit your finger, and the reason this is is to keep out ambient light. Why do we have to keep out ambient light? Well, there's a sensor in here that's reading a very specific type of light that we're gonna use to be able to measure our oxygen saturation. So all pulse oximeters are gonna, in some form, try to keep out other ambient light. Now, inside here, on one side, we have two different types of light, a red light and an infrared light. On the opposite side, we have a sensor that is reading how much light it picks up from these two different types of light. Now, as you slide your finger in a pulse ox, it's gonna shine this light through your nail bed or through the tip of your finger, and that sensor is gonna figure out how much light makes it to the other side. Oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin absorb these two different light frequencies at different rates. So based on these two lights making it through the finger to the other side where the sensor is, now the sensor can say, okay, I'm gonna take all the blood that I'm getting back and I'm gonna subtract the deoxygenated blood estimation based on how much light comes back. And what I should be left with is how much oxygenated blood there should be. So these will actually pulse the light. And when it does that, it's taking several different readings. It will read first the ambient light. So if there is any bleed over from the light, it takes that and it'll subtract that out of the equation. And then it pulses the other two lights and it picks up on how much light of each wavelength is making it through your finger. It's complicated, it's technical, but in short, think of a light shining from the top, a sensor on the bottom, and based on how much of these wavelengths make it through your finger, now this can calculate how much of that blood that it's looking at should have oxygen bound to it. Thus, you get a percentage of how much hemoglobin in your uh, arteries and capillaries should then have oxygen attached to them. Okay, so this is the most common type of pulse ox, um, but this is a pulse oximeter that is linked into a cardiac monitor, and this is gonna give us a little more detail. So we're actually gonna be able to get a pleth waveform here on the monitor. So as we slide this onto a patient's finger, notice we will start to get an oxygen saturation, we'll get a heart rate number, and then we'll also have this waveform readout here of the pleth. Now the monitor is gonna take the distance between these waveforms and it's gonna do a calculation to figure out what the heart rate is based on this. So any sort of movement here um, will change the waveform and that's gonna give you a false reading on both the oxygen percentage and the 
um, heart rate as this messes up. So when we're using a monitor like this, we want to take a look at this pleth and we want to make sure that we have a good waveform because that good waveform is going to tell us how accurate our readings actually are. So while we don't actually get a waveform on these small pulse oximeters, we get these lights that are blinking and that is a representation of the waveform you're going to see on a monitor. So while it's not as much information, it still gives you some information to know if you're getting a good uh, reading on this pulse ox. So you should be looking for these numbers to bounce all the way from the bottom to the top on a regular basis and that tells you you're getting a good readout. If they start flickering or moving, that means you're not actually getting a good reading on the pulse. You're getting some other artifact or some other movement that's triggering it. So there are several things we want to watch out for when using a pulse oximeter. There are several ways that we can get false readings with these. So we want to be aware of when we can get false readings so we know that if the number we're getting is actually accurate. Any sort of shaking or movement can give you a false waveform and a false number on the pulse oximeter. So you do want to make sure that the patient is staying relatively still. Small movements are not going to affect it in big ways, but if there's a lot of movement, um, seizures or something from the patient, just know that that number may be off a little bit. Another thing to watch out for are cold fingers. So so if you have cold fingers or toes or wherever you're placing the pulse ox, there's decreased blood flow. So while you may have good oxygen saturation in your arteries, the decreased blood flow to your fingertips is going to give you a uh, lower percentage on the pulse ox. So that's not going to be an entirely accurate number. So if you can warm those fingers or toes up, um, that will increase the circulation and allow you to be able to get a better reading. So you can use things like uh, the instant hot packs that you snap the water packet inside and it creates heat. You can try to warm it up by using your hands to warm up fingers, but if you can increase that circulation by adding warmth, that's going to give you a more accurate reading. Remember that we are using a red and an infrared light. So any other forms of red in that light is gonna give us a false reading. So, red fingernail polish or any fingernail polish, pink, red, anything like that, can give a distorted reading as well. So it's best to place these on fingers that don't have fingernail polish. So a lot of times EMTs will carry a fingernail polish remover and a small packet that you can tear open and use to remove fingernail polish and that will give you a more accurate reading. So do watch out for any fingernail polish when you're placing the pulse oximeter. The sensor in a pulse ox is reading red light and infrared light, but it also picks up ambient light and uses that ambient light to try to cancel that out so it gets a more accurate reading. But the more ambient light you have around, and the less that pulse ox is actually blocking out ambient light to the sensor, the less reliable of a reading you're gonna get. So, if the pulse ox does not have a bunch of ambient light, you're gonna get a more accurate reading. If the pulse ox is not blocking out that ambient light, and there's a lot of ambient light allowed to get into the sensor, your reading is not gonna be near as accurate. So do watch out for a lot of light leaks into the sensor on the pulse ox. Now one that's very simple and should be fairly obvious is if your pulse ox is not placed well, you need to have a good reading of that red and infrared light through the finger or nail bed in order to be able to get an accurate reading. So if your pulse ox is not put completely on the finger, it's not on there properly, it's gonna have a hard time getting an accurate reading. So that's kind of an obvious one, but I do wanna mention it. Make sure that that pulse ox is seated well and that it is on there firmly so it can get a good reading. So something else to watch out for. Anemia and blood loss can give you a false sense of oxygen perfusion in the cells. And here's the reason. So if you are missing blood from blood loss or anemia, if you're missing those hemoglobin that's carrying oxygen in your blood, your pulse ox is still gonna read that your hemoglobin still have great oxygen saturation. But in reality, you're missing a lot of those hemoglobin. So the pulse ox is not gonna give you a reading of how many hemoglobin there are. It's just gonna say of the hemoglobin present, you have a lot of oxygen attached to those hemoglobin. So if you placed a pulse ox on someone that has lost a lot of blood, the pulse ox may still read 98%, but they may not actually have enough blood to continue to perfuse those cells and take the oxygen to the cells. So while there may be hemoglobin and a good oxygen saturation, there may not be enough of that to do what needs to be done in the body. So just because you throw a pulse ox on somebody and it says 98% doesn't mean that they are getting adequate oxygenation to the tissues.
Okay, one more thing I want to talk about is carbon monoxide. This is something that you really need to be aware of. Carbon monoxide is a byproduct of incomplete combustion. So it's found anywhere there could be forms of flame or burning. So if you have a gas hot water heater, there could be potential for carbon monoxide. Any victim of a house fire or car fire that had some smoke inhalation could have some potential for carbon monoxide poisoning. So hemoglobin in your blood is like a magnet to oxygen. It attracts the oxygen, oxygen wants to stick to it. But think of the carbon monoxide as being a stronger magnet. So now you have a stronger magnet that's actually displacing the oxygen and that carbon monoxide wants to be bound to the hemoglobin. Well, when we're doing a reading with a pulse ox, that pulse ox is only looking for how much of something is attached to the hemoglobin. So the pulse ox may give you a reading of 98 or maybe even 100% saturation, but it doesn't know the difference between oxygen and carbon monoxide when it's bound to the hemoglobin. It just knows that there's a good portion of hemoglobin that now has something bound to it. So if you have a carbon monoxide poisoned patient, they may have carbon monoxide bound to their hemoglobin and not oxygen. That's a severe problem because that patient is suffocating. Their cells are not getting the oxygen they need. But if you pop a pulse ox on there, that pulse ox is going to read 100%. It says they're good to go. There's a lot of stuff bound to the hemoglobin. But it doesn't know what's actually bound to the hemoglobin. So you need to use your surroundings and be aware of the incident to know is there a potential for carbon monoxide poisoning. If you are treating somebody that just came out of a house fire or has some smoke inhalation, know that that's a potential. Or if you have someone that has the carbon monoxide symptoms of, hey, I was in my house, everyone in the house started getting headaches, we're dizzy, all these kind of things to where they're oxygen deprived and maybe they have a gas furnace or something that is now not being vented properly and you're having these carbon monoxide exposure, these are some clues that could clue you into, hey, we checked their vitals, 100% oxygen, but they're still having these symptoms. Well, don't rule out carbon monoxide yet. Um, keep that as a potential suspect until it can be uh, ruled out and proven not to be a case. So watch out for carbon monoxide. Definitely something that can give you a false reading. That wraps up our pulse ox video. Remember when you're using a pulse ox, it can give you three different forms of data. You get a heart rate, you get oxygen saturation, and then you get some sort of readout that tells you how accurate your reading actually is. So remember to keep an eye on that. If there's a waveform or if there's little bars, um, little lights that jump up and down, you wanna make sure you're getting a good, accurate pulse and you wanna make sure that you're getting a good, accurate reading. Uh, keep your eye out for anything that could give you a false reading. Keep these in the back of your mind as you're assessing patients so that you don't read just off the number. They always say, treat the patient, not the monitor. So if your monitor is giving you a reading that says 100% and your patient is struggling to breathe, something's not adding up. So make sure you continue to treat the patient and don't get stuck on the numbers on the monitor. This can be a great tool, but you have to make sure you use it properly and you don't just let that dictate your treatment for these patients. So that is the overview for the Pulse Ox. Hope you found this video helpful. Go ahead and like this video if it was helpful. Leave us a comment if you have any questions. Subscribe to the channel so you'll get more updates in the future. Stay vigilant, stay safe.